Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this session for April on the Gather Bible Study on Scripture and Nature, Teachers of Faith. And today we're talking about my favorite topic, hobby, activity, it's food. So, and I would be willing to guess, much like I do right now, that you probably have uh, at, at the least a cup of coffee, uh, maybe a, a little pastry or something nearby that you snack on while you do things like this. Um, there's a bite or two of some kind of food around and scripture is like food. It nourishes us and it sustains us. And the goal of this study, this particular session is not to try to tell you how to eat. Um, that is totally up to you. Um, it is to lift up some biblical themes about um, caring for creation and how our choices about food affect the creation in which we live. So um, to try to tell you how to eat would deny the, the variety, the diversity of cultures and health and principles that all influence how we eat. It's also impossible to claim that there's a biblical way of eating, since people even back in biblical times ate in lots of different ways. Even so, we can learn a lot from what the Bible has to say to us about food. We often forget that what we eat matters, not just for our own bodies, but also for the bodies and the lives of our neighbors, near and far, and the effect that it has on the non-human world the other creatures that God called good and calls us to care for and to be stewards of. So food is one more way that we can love the Lord our God and love our neighbors as ourselves. So take a bite of something good and let's talk about food. Hi, my name is Sarah Olson Smith. I'm one of the pastors at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Davenport, Iowa and the writer of this winter and spring's Bible studies for Gather magazine. We've been talking about creation, nature, and the Bible, about rivers and creatures and storms, different kinds of weather. And this month in April, we're talking about food. And we're here in my kitchen. I have to admit that one of my least favorite things, my least favorite household tasks is meal planning. Coming up with food that nourishes and feeds and is acceptable to my two kids and our crazy busy lives is not always an easy task. This question of what's for dinner is one that is an important one, not just for the health and well-being of my family, but the health and well-being and the flourishing of this whole world. It's a question about faith for me. Our faith is not just something that happens when we pray or as we do Bible studies together or even just simply about that one hour on a Sunday morning. Following Jesus means we do so with our whole selves, with our whole lives. And that includes thinking about how we eat, about food. For all of us, especially women in the United States, conversations about food are complicated not only because they matter for the well-being of creation and our bodies and human flourishing, but many of us have spent much of our lives counting calories or experiencing inner shame or outer critique about how our bodies look and what we're eating. The point of this study is not to create or advocate for yet another particular diet to limit the ways we eat or how we're supposed to think about eating, but instead to think about how we can nourish these beautiful, beloved bodies of ours in ways that are responsible to the flourishing of other beautiful, beloved bodies of humans and creatures in this creation around us. For many of us, we don't think about the Bible, about following Jesus when we make our meal plan or as we're hanging out in our kitchen or going to the grocery store. But for God's people in scripture, food and eating was an essential piece of how they understood their identity, about how they came to know who they were in relationship to God and live that relationship out in a daily way. The Levitical laws in the Hebrew Bible were full of directions about eating and about food, what Jewish people call keeping kosher. These daily commitments that not only formed community, 
but kept their faith grounded in a daily, hourly kind of way. And along with these specific instructions about what to eat and how to eat it, there's also all kinds of directions there about feeding hungry people, the orphan, the widow, the stranger, sharing from whatever abundance they had. But before, before receiving those laws about what it means to be faithful people, God's people learned a lot about food as they wandered in the wilderness after God freed them from enslavement in Egypt. God was, uh, was with them as they wandered through the wilderness and God heard their complaints about being hungry. They were longing for meat and leeks and they just wanted some food. God heard their complaints and sent them daily bread. This flaky substance that appeared on the ground outside of their tents every single day. This nourishing stuff was an unknown substance. And when the people first saw it, they said, what is it? Or in Hebrew, manna? Manna means, what is it? They learned in eating this bread that appeared outside their tents every single day to trust that God would provide their daily bread. But they also learned this important lesson that, as Dan Erlander said, hoarding stinks. If they kept more of that manna than they needed, the manna rotted, smelled terrible. Hoarding stinks. This lesson is an important one for us still, especially here in this country where tons and tons of good food is thrown away and wasted when there is still so much hunger. So one question we can ask ourselves as we think about food is as we make and buy and prepare it is how much? How much is enough? How much do I really need? How much can I share? One of the interesting chapters in our verses about food, things about food in the Bible comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. He writes about eating meat or not and how this shapes community. In this part of this letter, he's not necessarily talking about eating meat as a sort of piety, but instead about kind of preferences. And he teaches about these postures of eating that I think continue to teach us. The first posture is one of gratitude. In this part of Romans, which in the message is translated this, <laughs> Paul writes, if you eat meat, eat it into the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. <laughs> If you're vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. We start first in our eating from this place of gratitude for everything we receive is a gift from God, comes from God. And from this posture of gratitude, we realize that we are bound up into this world and with others to God. When my daughter was young, maybe three, four-ish, a preschooler, and we were saying our prayers, one day she sat down and she said, we said, thank you, God. And she started listing off all the things she was thankful for. Thank you, God, for these chicken nuggets and for the chickens and especially for those chickens with the cool feathery socks on them and for the farmers and for chicken coops and for the worms and the little bugs they eat. For the people who drove those chickens to the store and for the people who made the boxes and the people at the store, she just kept going. And then she looked at her plate and said, and we thank you God for ketchup and for tomatoes and for the ground and for the farmers and for the rain and for the farmers' kids and for the chicken nuggets that those kids ate. She was really just on a roll and you get the idea. She had this posture of gratitude this realization that these chicken nuggets on her plate connected her to God and to this whole world to whom gifted her with this food. And then with this gratitude comes this posture of intention or commitment to care or mindfulness of our actions, even when our eating, that our eating impacts other people and this world. Paul goes on to write in Romans, if your sibling is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. 
While Paul writes about shared meals in their early Christian community where they gathered for meals and some had some and some didn't have any and how they could be together, those words can still be for us now as Paul directs them and us to eat in ways that, quote, pursue peace and mutual upbringing. Paul pulls us into relationship with God and God's people to be confronted about how our choices might cause others injury or could bring them upbringing, mutual upbringing. Those folks we were just thanking God for, the farmers and those preparing food for us, those who work late to stock shelves or farmers who are often in debt and worried about how their future will be. Immigrant children in meat processing plants, others who prepare our food. We can ask ourselves, how do, do these choices injure other people or how does it help bring them up? Does it harm creatures or creation that I'm called to steward or protect? And if so, how can I change the way that I eat so that I'm walking in love? These last months, we've been talking about storms and about creatures and about rivers. It's pretty clear that we in the United States eat way more meat and dairy than we need to. Our diet is not sustainable for this planet and it can be dangerous or cause harm for water, our land, other people. So one way that we can live in faithful responsibility to this planet of ours that God has given to us is to eat less meat, to support local farmers who have sustainable practices, to think about the ways our eating impacts creation and future generations. Even just small changes in our diet can have a great impact, can change things to bring about the mutual upbringing of the creation we love. You can, in this study, you can look at some of those passages from the book of Genesis to invite deeper conversation about this. Jesus spent a lot of time eating with people. He used this image of a wedding banquet, a feast, to describe God's reign in the world, where all people are drawn in, where everyone is welcome, where there's food for everyone and enough abundant amounts of food. There's so much joy and goodness in the sharing of food. Holden Village, a Lutheran retreat center in Washington state, has a really deep commitment, a philosophy of eating and food. They take this their eating seriously and also playfully with a communal and joyful uh, intention of the ways they eat. And they have this philosophy. I'm going to read just a little bit of it for you. It goes like this. Part of it is, we are committed to serving food that is careful, food that is both celebratory and responsible. We strive to cook in ways that are healthy and delicious and expressive that minimize harm to individuals and communities near and far. Meals, wedding feasts, and ordinary weeknight suppers can be times that are both celebratory and responsible. These meals we share are meant to be places of joy and community and goodness, and even when we're eating alone, connect us to others and this world. The goodness of love that can happen around tables is in like anything else that we do as humans. It doesn't have to just be at weddings or big events, but when we sit down and share a meal by ourselves with other people around a table, when we pray and give thanks and we eat and we talk and we laugh, we remember how we're bound up in this beautiful food with the world. We get glimpses of this joy that Jesus describes as the reign of God, this heavenly wedding feast. Food is something that is both personal and communal. We all eat. My hope in this study is that it can help you think intentionally about how you eat and how our eating can be in alignment with our faith. The ways we work for the mutual upbringing of others and ourselves, the ways we share so that all can flourish, the ways we invite others in so we can know the joy of community, how we can live in ways that are both celebratory 
and responsible in gratitude for our daily bread and these ways we are bound up with each other and all creation. So have fun with these studies. Enjoy the conversations, but give grace to each other and yourselves. And if you don't usually have snacks while you're studying the Bible on your own or in your own circles of conversation, this is a time to have some snacks, to share some food, and give thanks to God who continues to nourish us and all this world. Thanks and many blessings to you. Now, as we've done in previous studies, um, you're invited to do some reflection with each section of the study that comes along. And you might do this in different ways. Um, you might do it later. Uh, you also might journal and jot down your thoughts and reflections, things that come to mind as you go along in the study. Um, and, and you might just kind of reflect briefly, internally, and then move on. But some of the scripture passages we have for this particular session are lengthy. And so they appear on more than one screen. So I would encourage you as you get to reading, and of course, people read at different speeds. So when you get to the readings, pause the video, take your time reading, notice things that maybe you didn't notice before, or if there's something that uh, causes you to go, hmm, maybe jot that down. And sometime if we have the opportunity, uh, we can chat about it. But in any case, uh, scripture readings, reflection questions, there'll be opportunities to stop the video, take as much time as you need for those things, and then uh, continue on. But let's begin our study with the opening prayer. God, creator of all living things, you fashioned a world in which lands and waterways, plants and animals together meet the needs of all that you made. We pray that such vitality may flourish around the globe. Bless those who work the soil and who manage animals. Uphold their towns and villages, nurture bees and other pollinators, protect farmlands and ranches from drought and flood. Free children from forced labor in the fields. Grant an economy that can sustain those families who treasure a rural life. Teach us how to share with everyone the benefits of each harvest and accept our gratitude for all sustenance you provide. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So right off the bat here, you have an opportunity to read Luke chapter 14, verses 7 to 14. Now back in Jesus' day, most Jewish families were subsistence farmers or tradespeople growing some of their own food and then trading, uh, bartering, if you will, for others. Bread, vegetables, grains, legumes, fruit, and olives were all part of a simple diet. Those who were near the water had the opportunity to eat fish. But like many people around the world today, most of them consumed meat only on special days or as a small part of their daily diet. Because, well, frankly, uh, they didn't have refrigeration like we do. And so there was usually just enough for the day. Now, you've probably noted uh, over time that Jesus spends a lot of time eating with people. Then, as now, shared meals build relationships and demonstrate care. Jesus' meals topple hierarchies and upset the order of the day. It depicts a radical hospitality where we invite people to our tables who are not like us, people who might not be able to pay us back, either materially or with equal social status. Jesus's own practices teach us that faithful eating is not just about what we eat, but even with whom we eat. Now, in the Bible, weddings bring an abundance of food, wine, and community. I mean, the whole town is invited, animals are slaughtered, Wine flows freely. Even Jesus often describes the reign of God as a wedding banquet with lavish joy, a lot of community, and tons of food. Sometimes we kind of create that ceremonial banquet feeling in our own family meals when we bring out the good china or maybe the wine glasses to have grape juice in or something like that. And we make toasts and say cheers and we celebrate with one another. Sitting down with other people to share a meal 
is unlike anything else that we do as humans. No matter what's on our plates, we glimpse the love and the joy that Jesus describes as that heavenly wedding feast. So here's a reflection question for you. Think of a meal that you shared with people outside your inner circle. I, I'm particularly thinking about this because I'm going to the Riverview annual meeting, which includes a meal and sitting with people that I likely won't know. But in the midst of that, something will be joyful. Somehow we'll experience the breaking of God's reign in that moment. I'm wondering if you can think of a similar time where you gathered around in a meal setting with people who weren't part of your immediate family and what you can recall about that the presence of God in that moment. Hey, you have an opportunity now to read Exodus 16, 1 to 31. This will be on several screens. It's followed up by a question, what does this story tell you about faith and food? So keep that question in your mind as you read, and then take a few moments to jot down any thoughts or make note of uh, what you noticed in the story. So um, after God's people are liberated from slavery in Egypt, they wander for a long time through the desert wilderness. And no doubt, uh, when the Egyptians and Pharaoh finally said, please, just, just go, take whatever you want, they probably took uh, quite a load of food with them. But eventually that ran out because, you know, desert. And they began to grumble and complained against the Lord, saying things like, what you read, why why bring us out here to die? We had great food back in Egypt. Well, hearing their complaints, God sends a flaky food to the flaky people. They called it manna as it covered the ground. It's related to the question that they ask in the text, uh, because the word manhu in Hebrew literally means, what is it? This manna arriving from heaven, uh, shows up every morning, except on the Sabbath. And as we read, quail show up in the evening. Most of you, many of you, some of you, I don't want to make too many assumptions here, but some of you might be familiar with Dan Erlander's work, and in particular, his little booklet, Manna and Mercy, a Brief History of God's Unfolding Promise to Mend the Entire Universe. He calls this 40-year period the wilderness school where the people learn about being faithful to God. And in Dan's words, those lessons include lesson one, God gives manna for all. And lesson two, hoarding stinks. From the gift of manna, the people learn that all food is God's. In fact, everything is God's. We own nothing. We can trust God for daily bread because God gives everyone enough for each day. Now, in typical human fashion, some want more, either out of fear or out of a desire to kind of have some influence over others from what they've accumulated. But when people take too much, the man grows worms and spoils and it starts to stink. The lessons here are also for us. Trust God for daily bread. Hoarding our food and other things stinks. When we share more, when we take and waste less, we become part of the way that God provides daily bread for everybody. Again, a reflection question. When have you learned the lessons that hoarding stinks and that God provides manna for all? And, and some of us might equate that with uh, a saying that is fairly common, God provides, right? So think about your experiences of God providing or 
finding that gathering everything you could for yourself wasn't as great as you thought and reflect on that for a moment. Okay, we have a reading here from Genesis 1, verses 27 to 31. God's first word to humanity here echoes the voices of so many, our grandparents, grandmothers. Here's some food, sit down, eat, enjoy. God begins with the gift of food inviting us to relate to creation in ways of kinship and reciprocity. God is saying, see, I've given you and the critters too, all these vegetables and all this fruit to eat. It's the opposite of other Mesopotamian creation stories of the time, which claim that humanity's creation was for the sole purpose of supplying food for the gods. But for our God, always the divine arrow points downward. God gives an abundance of food, not just to humans, but that to everything that has breath. In the beginning, God's abundant diet for humanity appears to be plant-based, just vegetables and fruit. Nobody, not even the creatures, needs to die to feed another. All beings can flourish without violence. There's enough food for every creature. Genesis says God saw everything that God had made, and indeed, it was very good. Now, that very goodness is not just about the humans created on the sixth day, but about the amazing goodness of all of creation together in wholeness and interdependence, thriving and, and abundant as God made them. This vision of the world is echoed in Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 9, where we read that the lion shall eat straw like an ox, and the wolf shall live with the lamb at a time when they will not hurt or destroy. It's no secret that we no longer live in that perfect goodness of Genesis, where neither human nor creature killed one another to live. But God's very goodness continues. And that vision of all creation can still shape the choices that we make about what we eat. So with this uh, definite vegetarian emphasis present in this Genesis reading, what are your favorite vegetables or fruits? And how could you maybe work more of them into your daily diet? Moving on, Genesis 9, verses 1 to 11. After the flood, God again blesses God's people and refuses to give up on humanity. We are fortunate, indeed, that we have the God that we do. Again, our generous God gives the gift of food. But now, in addition to the stuff that grows from the soil, humans are permitted to eat the stuff that moves I give you everything, God says in verse 3. Well, not quite everything. God adds only, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Now, a lot of ink and blood has been spilled over what is meant by this. Even as God permits the eating of meat, God demands a deep respect for the value of life all life. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Wall Kimmerer, a scientist, writer, and member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation, offers a helpful perspective about what she calls an honorable harvest. She writes, the taking of another life to support your own is far more significant than when you recognize the beings who are harvested as persons. Non-human persons vested with awareness, intelligence, spirit, and who have families waiting for them at home. Killing a who demands something different than killing an it. Now, in Genesis, God speaks pretty clearly about the value of human life and against harming other human beings. 
But as we think about responsible eating, restraint is not just about the killing or mistreatment of our non-human kin, but about the environmental consequences of our diet, which can also impact human lives. The ways we eat impact our climate. For example, raising and producing meat contributes significantly to greenhouse gases and use many land and water resources. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can go to www.waterfootprint.org. We can promote food systems and ways of eating that tend to the well-being of creatures, land, water, and other humans who already feel the impact of climate change. One way to do this is to eat less meat. Now, Teresa and I are trying to introduce more plant-based things uh, into our diet, but I gotta tell you, a nice steak or some bacon with breakfast is something that would be hard for me to just totally let go of. And yet there are ways to be better about those things, to find locally sourced uh, sources for those types of things. Uh, we have the resources to access meat from amazing local producers in our area. And I, you know, I'll eat whatever somebody puts in front of my plate when I'm blessed to be at their table, but each of us can find ways try to eat in ways that respect and value life, all life, and recognize that the taking of one, even a non-human life, for the sake of our own survival, is not an insignificant task. So with that in mind, how might these passages from Genesis challenge or confirm your own eating habits? You have two lessons here to take a look at. They're both fairly brief, Leviticus 19 and Matthew 12. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with gleaning myself, although um, having served almost a decade in rural parishes and helping uh, with harvest time in several of them, mostly by driving a truck alongside a combine, um, I'm familiar with what gleaning is about, and I've seen firsthand as you harvest a field, those stalks that get left behind or missed along the way. And uh, there's an ancient practice of leaving all of that for the, the folks in the community who are hungry. It limits food waste and it feeds hungry people. So we see in Leviticus, as the people settle into the promised land, God reminds the community not to pick the land bare when they are harvesting. Instead, leave some. Leave the stuff along the edges. Leave the things that the, the plow or the harvester or the combine, in our case today, misses. Leave that for the poor, the needy, the stranger, the orphan, the widow. Wealthy farmers and even the subsistence ones would leave some of the harvest behind for people who didn't have land or means by which to grow their own food. They could just come and wander through the field and, and pick what was left behind for their own sustenance. This is what we see Jesus doing with his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. And they are condemned for picking and eating grain from a field on the Sabbath. Now, for contemporary readers like us, it might seem strange that religious leaders are more concerned about the day of the week than the fact that neither the land nor the grain belongs to them. Um, we, we love to just kind of point out people's faults, even when it really has nothing to do with us. But in Jesus' day, the community allowed travelers, all of whom would be vulnerable and food insecure, to glean from the fields. These ancient laws ensured that those with an abundance shared with those who had little. Today, it is devastating when so much perfectly good food is tossed aside. And I am probably as bad at that as anybody. Um, when we owned our house, we would do a lot of shopping at Costco, right? Because good deals, um, volume, we had plenty of storage space. But we often didn't get 
to everything that we purchased in time to use it and consume it for ourselves and it wasted and it went bad and we threw it away. And it's, it's sad, it's unfortunate, not only because people are hungry out there, but because of all the, the land use and the fossil fuels and the creatures that gave their lives that were wasted as a result of not using that food. And food rescue work today is gleaning with a modern twist. Many organizations, for example, save day-old bread and leftover buffet meals that can't be sold. Groups then share this bounty with people who really need it. And, and of course, we have done a, a lot as a congregation and many of you as individuals volunteering for organizations like Meals on Wheels and Second Harvest, all of whom uh, work to make sure that food does not go to waste but gets to people who really need it. So uh, the reflection question is, have you ever gleaned? And I would invite you to kind of broaden your understanding of that. You might not have walked through a field plucking heads of grain, but how have you helped to take food that was left behind and made sure it got to hungry people? Another short reading here from Isaiah chapter 55. All right, so I don't want anybody telling me that I can't spend my money on Hostess chocolate covered donuts or Reese's peanut butter cups or the occasional apple fritter. <clears throat> However, I do spend a lot of money at Starbucks for coffee drinks. Why do I buy so much stuff that doesn't nourish me? I mean, in our contemporary Western culture, we spend a lot of money on things that aren't technically food. I try reading the list of unpronounceable ingredients on some of, this, some of these snacks. Food isn't good for our bodies. It's not good for our planet. So why do we spend our money on that which is not food? Well, the fact is, for a lot of people, it is the only thing they can afford. For others, it's familiar or it's easy. It's also formulated to make us crave it. I'm not going to get any conspiracy here, theories here, but the simplest thing is that stuff that has sugar in it, our bodies love sugar, and so do some of the diseases that our bodies have to fight off. Isaiah is probably speaking in metaphors here, naming the good that God promises to bring to God's people. Still, the words can be an invitation to think about eating real food. That is, items with ingredients that have names that you recognize. Without chemicals or processing. Stuff that can be grown or raised or prepared. This food is good for our bodies and it's good for our planet. And as we savor the real food in front of us, we remember the one who gives us good food. The food that satisfies. God wants to fill us with good things that will satisfy. And when Jesus taught about prayer, he asked, Is there any among you who, if your child asks for bread, would give a stone? Or if your child asks for fish, would give a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? That, you may recall, is from Matthew 7. So, Many of us fill our emptiness with various things that don't satisfy. Take a moment to consider this reflection question. Sometimes people confuse food with power. And have you read this passage from Romans 14 and think about this question, what sort of behaviors around food does Paul call out as harmful? And what sort of behaviors would build up?
And Paul is writing here to an early Christian community of believers who are divided by what foods to eat and whether some days should be celebrated. Now, the food debate here doesn't seem to be a split between the Jewish and the non-Jewish parts of the community because faithful Jews would not be required to be vegetarian. So it seems the issue is less about piety and more about preference. Paul seems less concerned with what people eat and more about how they eat. So how do we eat? According to Paul, we eat with gratitude. In the message paraphrase of the Bible, Eugene Peterson translates verse 6 to say, If you eat meat, eat it to the glory of God and thank God for prime rib. If you're a vegetarian, eat vegetables to the glory of God and thank God for broccoli. This gratitude to God is echoed throughout Scripture. Deuteronomy 8.10 reads, You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he's given you. We are reminded again that God is generous. With Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 men plus women and children. Gratitude ought to be our first response. Our food didn't just show up on our plate. A.J. Jacobs writes in A Thousand Thanks about praying his thanks for the food on his plate and all the people who made it possible. His son asked why he had thanked God, but not the actual people. So Jacobs tried to do just that. He started by saying, thank you to everyone who made his cup of coffee happen. It started with the barista, went on to the truck driver, and the person who paved the road on which the truck drives, and so on. As people of faith, we are grateful first to God, and then to all the ones, human and non-human, who help bring food to our tables. So with that in mind, think a minute about your breakfast. Who might you thank for that meal? Now, in Romans 14, Paul doesn't weigh in on what kind of food is better to eat than another, though it does feel uh, like a bit of a slight to call vegetarians weak. Paul does call the community out for setting themselves above others and looking down on each other. Their judgments are destructive to their community and involve a kind of condescending superiority we often judge each other for how we eat. Maybe it's about meat, like in the Roman church of Paul's day. Or maybe it's because of prejudices about others' appearance or their economic status. Maybe we think that some of the food in other cultures is weird. I've even heard people comment about people who use SNAP benefits or food stamps in ways that others don't approve of. Later, Paul writes, if your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. In a community which ate meals together regularly, some were asked to abstain from meeting, eating meat or shift other eating habits for the sake of the greater good and the growing faith of others in order to pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Paul's words lead me to consider the people that I was just praying for, folks stocking shelves late at night, farmers who spent long hours working and worrying, immigrant children working in unsafe conditions at meat, pro meat processing plants. Does our eating injure other people, creatures, and the creation that we're called to steward and protect? If this is the case, how can we change the way we eat so that we are? walking in love. So this is another opportunity to reflect a little bit. Think about the foods that you buy, the way that you eat, and who might be injured by what you eat, and what big or small shifts can you make to walk more faithfully in love. Well, as we wrap up this session, there's one biblical meal I say for last. It's the Jesus's last one, too the institution of the Lord's Supper. Holy Communion is what we refer to in the Lutheran tradition, and as do others, as a means of grace, the place Jesus promises to show up in love for us. 
Everything we need to know about faithful eating can be learned for the Lord's Supper, where there is a place for everyone and enough for everyone. Nothing is wasted. The meal is simple. It's just bread and wine. Nothing fancy, expensive, or harmful. Just simple, celebratory, and accessible. So each week we say thank you and acknowledge that all creation sings praise alongside us. Each week we learn to take and bless and break and share and receive, becoming what we eat, Christ's body, sent to feed a hungry world. Thank you for being part of this study. Um, let's close with this prayer. Take a few moments to thank God for your favorite foods and for all the people, places, and creatures that brought those foods to you. So I invite you to just go ahead and end this video now and spend a, a few moments uh, giving that praise to God. And we'll see you next time.